It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord, and I am so excited to be able to worship with you all today. Um, if this is your first time to worship with us here at Highland, I just want to say welcome. And, and again, I'm excited that you have taken the time to worship with us here in this place. Maybe you're watching online, and if that's the case, again, welcome. A few announcements I would like to bring to your attention. Um, next Sunday, we, we've got two different um, uh, uh, times I want to bring to your attention. At the end of the morning worship service next Sunday, we will have a special called business meeting to, uh, to, to formally elect a deacon. Y'all um, turned in your ballots a few weeks ago, and, and we want to conclude that piece of business. That'll be next Sunday morning. Next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, we will have our quarterly business meeting. Um, I, in, in this building, I believe, in this room, uh, David, is, ma'am? Hey, it's in the fellowship hall. It is not in this room. So I just want to make, yeah, y'all are paying attention. That was a trick. Good job. Um, it will be in the fellowship hall next Sunday at 5 o'clock. Uh, again, just want to make sure y'all are aware that. would love for y'all to join us. That's, again, our quarterly business session next Sunday evening at the 17th at 5 o'clock. Um, also on that Sunday, y'all remember uh, uh, Ray Spence came and preached for us several times when we were in our, our interim ship before David came as our senior pastor, and we will have him again next Sunday. If you have not kept up with his ministry, he is an, an itinerant preacher, he's an evangelist, and just has an incredible job preaching the gospel. And we are so excited to have Ray come next Sunday and be able to preach the gospel for us here again. We will be taking up a love offering for him, so I do encourage you to come uh, to, ready to receive the message that God has placed on his heart for us, and also ready to give uh, willingly, sacrificially, to be able to further the ministry that God has called him to. And then one other announcement I would like to bring to your attention is that here in just a couple of weeks, we are uh, going to be celebrating Resurrection Sunday, and then the week prior to that, like we normally do, we will be having our Holy Week lunches down in the, in the um, FLC, uh, lunch, a time of, of worship through the opening and studying of God's Word. So, you know, you, you got to eat lunch, so you might as well get fed spiritually while you're at it. would love for y'all to join us during that as well. That's that Monday through Friday uh, leading up to Easter Sunday. I believe that's all the announcements that we have. And as we prepare our heart for worship, I would love for you to listen along as we read through part of Psalm 57, where David says, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till, till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. How incredible is that? That we undoubtedly will have to endure through the storms of this world as a result of the brokenness and the sin that we as, as mankind introduced into this world we have to deal with the consequence of it. But our God in his love, in his mercy, says that he will not abandon us, but he will come along beside us. And David says in full assurance amidst those storms, I know my God will be faithful. So with that in mind, I would love for you to pray with me as we continue on in worship, as we worship the God who says he will never abandon us, forsake us, or leave us, but he will be with us always and forever. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for the fact that you are good. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And Lord, this morning, whether we're here in person, whether we're watching online, Lord, I pray that, that our worship will be genuine, our worship will be sincere, because you are the only one who is worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. So as we sing, as we pray, as we give our tithes and offerings, Lord, as we open your word, Lord, I pray that you are glorified. Lord, we love you, and as you know that we pray, amen. Would you stand, please, as we worship and sing about the great things God has done?
When I tell people I'm a missionary, I get all kinds of questions. People ask, what kind of missionary are you? Or they want to know exactly what it is a missionary does. Or a lot of times you'll hear people say, a missionary here? You mean that's a thing? Well, there's 281 million lost people in the U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, it's a thing. But there's one question no one ever asked me, and I wish they would. No one ever asked it, where is the finish line? That's the question I want to hear. What does mission accomplish look like? You can watch videos about North American missionaries like me. You can read stories about us, you can pray for us. But don't get so caught up in the methods and minutia of what we do that you miss the main thing. Everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end. We start churches to make Jesus known. We meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Nada. Nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what our finish line looks like. It looks like obedience, same as your finish line. <laughs> God speak, you give, we go. Everything starts with your gift, so the any I'm strong is the offering. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where, together, we make Jesus known. Just like the missionary in the video said, you give, they go. And so you have an incredible opportunity to be um, obedient and to give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering this year. Our church goal is $25,000 and we're going to be doing a whole month's emphasis this month on Annie Armstrong and showing you different videos of how missionaries are being sent and where they're being sent and what good things are happening because you give to that offering. So if I could encourage you in any way, just like we encouraged you with Lottie Moon, give more than you gave last time. If you didn't give to the, to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, consider giving this time. And then if you did give, try to give a little more than you gave last year so that collectively together... We can reach our goal of 25000 We can give, and they can go, and so that they can make Jesus known in all the world. Is that a deal? I think we can do that. Would you stand as we continue to worship and sing, There is a Redeemer and in the presence of Jehovah.
struggle for the answers that I need. But then I come into your presence, and all of my questions become clear. And for the sacred moment, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 13. That's Nehemiah chapter 13. In the presence of Jehovah, I wish it were as easy growing in the Lord as just a church service sometimes, that people are singing around us, people are singing over us, and we are just caught up and enraptured of what God is doing. But when we leave here in this place, it's not that easy, is it? It's not that easy. We have to intentionally put ourselves into the presence of God. We come, as Hebrew says, into the presence with confidence through the blood of Christ Jesus. Well, the past few weeks, um, I've learned a new skill. One that I did not want to have, one that I don't want to employ anymore, and I hope I don't have to have anymore, but nevertheless, I did. And in all was because of probably pride. Husbands, you probably have been here at some point before. The dryer goes out, and it could be any piece of equipment. In our house, it was a dryer. It went out, and I'm thinking, I don't know how to fix this stupid thing. I don't care about this stupid thing. I hate washing clothes. I hate drying clothes. I hate everything about this piece of equipment. And I look at it for a little bit, and I'm like, you know, I can't, there, I'm not about to tear this thing apart. I don't know anything how to do this. And then my wife says to me, and this is nothing on her, this is just honesty, and I would have said the same thing. Look, I understand, I didn't marry a washer and dryer guy. And then I said, you know what? <laughs> I'm about to do this thing. <laughs> so I became very proficient in dismantling this dryer. I mean, to get to this one part, 
I had to take the entire thing apart, and it was thrown throughout our house. I didn't know where. Somehow I ended up with too many screws. I don't know where these things came from. And this everywhere. And then I fixed the part, and then I looked, man, there's another part that is broken. And so then we have to order that, and we're out of, you know, washer and dryer for about a week and a half. And then finally I was thinking, how in the world am I going to get this thing back together? I don't even remember where all these screws go. I couldn't have put it back together at the beginning if it would have been 30 minutes after I took it apart. By the Lord's will and spirit, though, when it came time to put this thing apart, it all went back to part. I did, I, I did have an extra screw left, um, probably because I had a few screws loose, but, um, but I did uh, put it back together. But that's not the end of the story. It lasted two days. I took it apart again, fixed it again. It lasted two days. I took it apart again. This time I could almost do it in my sleep. I became very proficient. I took this thing apart again yesterday for the fourth time and put it back together for the fourth time. Now I don't want to have to do that ever again, but as I was doing that, and as I was thinking about literally Nehemiah 13, there are things in our life there are, spiritually speaking, there are things in our life that we have to keep coming back at. We have to keep looking at. We have to keep fixing or allowing God to fix, bringing them to God over and over and over and over again until it gets monotonous. But you know what? We still do it. It's not as easy as just coming to church and that all happening in our life in an hour-long session, in an hour-long worship. This is the catalyst. This is the reminder of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he has done everything possible and that if we will submit to his spirit, if we will walk in his spirit, that he will begin to renovate. He will begin to revitalize. He will begin to restore all that is not of Christ. Nehemiah 13 is an unfortunate story. For the past 10 weeks, we have spent talking and discussing about this ongoing work that God is doing through Nehemiah to the people of Israel. They've rebuilt the wall. Great. They've restored their worship. Wonderful. They've made promises to God. Awesome. Things were going good until chapter 13. And chapter 13 is the end of the book. But it's not the end of the story. It's the end of the book, and it ends on a bad note. So we're going to take the negative aspect of what Israel did and what they reverted to, and we don't like preaching in negative, so we're going to turn that to positive directives, that the ongoing work of spiritual renewal, there are four key areas that we see in Nehemiah 13 that they got wrong, but we're going to get right because of who Jesus is because of the Spirit living and moving through us. But make no mistake, if you're only trying to get revived in here and not out there, you're going to end up just like Israel. So if you would, let's end our time together looking at Nehemiah 13 and this ongoing spiritual renewal project in these four key areas that we need to keep track of. The first area that we need to look at that Israel failed in was church life, the faithful community. And so we're gonna just kind of walk through this because it's such a long, lengthy section. We're gonna read a little bit, make observations, read a little bit, and just kind of walk through this chapter together. So church life, the directive here is that we should look to Christ and follow him, that we look to Christ and we follow him individually and we follow him together as a church look at verses one through three let's see what happened on that day they read from the book of moses in the hearing of the people and in it was found written that no ammonite or moabite should ever enter the assembly of god for they did not meet the people of israel with bread and water but hired balaam against them to curse them yet our god turned the curse into a blessing as soon as the people heard the law, they separated from all Israel those foreign of foreign descent. Israel, the people of God, those who had been renovated, restored in their worship, 
Now, just a little bit later, a very short time later, now they're complacent with those who are in their midst. Now they're okay with the enemy inside the gate. And what makes things even worse is that if you go back to chapter 10, they promise to separate themselves from all foreign people and that they would be a pure community of God. And now here they are in chapter 13, just a little bit of time later, Nehemiah's not there, he's back in Persia again, and as soon as he's gone, they revert back. So they're breaking the promise of God here that they made with God. They're breaking God's commandment to not, uh, to, to not intermingle and be influenced by outsiders. They allowed foreigners to be a part of their lives and to have influence in their life. They allowed people who did not know God to have more influence in their life than God. James 4.4 4 warns the New Testament believer about this. He says, you adulterous people, do you, not, do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever is to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. See, when we come in here and we want to design and worship and do everything that is influenced by the world, God doesn't like that. That is, does not please God. When we orient our life around things that the world is passionate about, but God is not, God is not okay with that. Being passionate about what the world is passionate about is going against what Jesus is passionate about because these two people or these two groups are heading in opposite direction. And then we see in verses four through nine, look there with me. He goes on, now before this, so one through three is sort of a summary. Here's what was happening inside of this. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, do you remember him? He's the one that said, hey, a fox is going to break down that wall. It's nothing. He's an enemy. So he was related, the priest was related to Tobiah. He prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandments to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contribution for the priests. While this was taking place... I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers. And I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So here in this section, what was happening, if we dive into the summary of one through three, the, the idea here is that Israel, through Eli Eliashib, the priest, had allowed Tobiah, the enemy, to hold influence over them, its leaders, and ultimately set himself up inside of the temple. How crazy is that? that the one who was mocking them, the one who was slandering them, the one who was ridiculing them, now has a room to lodge in in the temple. So Nehemiah comes and cleans house. 10 through 14, read there with me. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled to each, each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed a treasury over the storehouses, Shilamiah, the priest, Zadok, the scribe, Padiah of the Levites, and their assistant, Hanan, and the son, the son of Zakur, son of Madaniah, for they were considered reliable. And their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this. And do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Israel had not only become complacent and accustomed to the enemy of God, the enemies of God, 
residing within their own community that it eventually affected the worship leadership within their community, which affected those who actually were working for the good of the community. The Levites, the Levites had to go home and find work. They had to go back to their fields because the house of God was not being provided for anymore. John Maxwell, he's famous for talking about leadership, you know, and all that. And he's, he has a very simple quote, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. Leadership is influence. Israel's worship and community of faith was being influenced by the enemy. Worship and the provisions for worship, it had become an afterthought. The status quo, we're okay with this. They're apathetic, they're complacent to the things of God. And I don't think this is a, something that merely happens just in Old Testament. This even happens today in churches around the world, specifically churches in America, and maybe even happening in your heart today in this church. Let me show you this graph. I know you're not gonna be able to see the details. I'm gonna help you understand the details, but this is a graph that I believe kind of points to why this happens or what is happening in many of our churches. And so this is coming from Barna, uh, the research group, this is basically a graph from 2015. The, the survey was 2015. The book came out 2016, where Americans are on their spiritual journey. And if you see the blue, the large percentage, that's 64% of Americans, these are all Americans, 64%, according to their exhaustive survey, 64% would, would, would say that they are not born again. They have not trusted in Christ as their savior. Okay, they are not born again. That's not that difficult to believe. We see many people like that day in and day out that you work with, that you go to ball fields with and all of that. 64% of Americans would not most likely be born again. But the green, the green I believe is where many of our churches are and where many of our people in our churches are. That green is 24% of people who would say they are born again, but they are not spiritually broken or pursuing it. What does that mean? It means they've got their get out of hell free card and they're okay with that. I got salvation, that's coming one day, praise the Lord, but I'm just gonna live life like I want to now. I would argue if you even have your salvation at that point. But for the sake of the graph, how many in here would be that? That you're not broken because of sin in your life and the sin around you. And there's no pursuing holiness in your life. The only time you think about God is when you walk through those doors and you don't think about him again until you get back. Are you broken for sin? Are you pursuing Christ-likeness in your life? 24% would say, no, I'm good with just salvation. The 6%, the gray one, the one next to it, born again, spiritually discontent. We, we know that something's wrong. I can't really put my finger on it. I mean, every time the pastor preaches, I mean, I feel a little bad about it, but I don't know what to do about it. I kind of forget about it until I get back again and I hear it again. 6% would say they are spiritually discontent, but not broken over their sin. And then 3%, the yellow above it, are born again and spiritually broken. The red, born again, broken, surrendered, and submitted to Christ. And then 1% would be saved, broken, surrendered, and fully loving God and people as best they can. What we want is we want a church of one percenters. We do, that's what Jesus wants, that's not what I want. Jesus died to not be okay with sin in our life, 
but to remake us, to restore us, to make us into the image of himself. And what that looks like is that 1%, that we are broken over sin. We are fully submitted to him. We're fully following the Holy Spirit's guidance in our life. We allow him to root out the things that are not of God. And in the process, we want to love God with everything that we are. And we love our neighbor, whether we like them or not, with all that we are. Why? Because Jesus did that for us. Where are you in that graph? Church life matters. We want members who are passionately pursuing holiness together. You need me and I need you to do that. We need one another to pursue Christ together. We want members who reflect the heart of God more every year, which is to love him and love others wholeheartedly, completely, and unashamedly. Israel let worldly influences in, and it took over their worship. I pray that we will look to Christ, and we follow him. So we want to look at our church life, but we also want to look into our personal life. The ongoing restoration project happens in our personal life as well. Look at verses 15. Start there with me. In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine and grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also who lived in the city brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people in, of Judah in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing that you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Did your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of waters lodged wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, Why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Now, I do need to mention here, the Bible many times is either, either, it's either descriptive or prescriptive. Just because it's describing Nehemiah's version of church discipline does not mean that we do that. We don't lay hands on people. Um, we have prescriptions for church uh, discipline. That's Matthew 18. That's a good place to go. And so we have prescriptions that God has laid out, but he's so zealous for the glory of God and for God's name to be known that this is the route that he takes. He lays hands on, or he threats, threatens to lay hands on these people at this point. In our personal life, we must make spending time with the Lord a priority. God does not deserve a back seat to our endeavors. He is not an afterthought. He's not a, if you have time, come see me kind of person. He deserves our time. He gave us our time. He helps us redeem our time. He takes top priority over our time. And so this whole section is about time, this day called the Sabbath. Now, if you, just a brief rundown of what the Sabbath is. Of course, Israel broke the Sabbath command, which was given in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. But it's not only that they broke the command, but again, if you go back to chapter 10, one of the promises they made in verse 31 is, we will keep the Sabbath, God. We're going to do it, God. You can count on us, God. We're not going to fail again. Ever said that to God? They did. So what is the Sabbath? Well, technically speaking, it's the seventh day of the week. The Sabbath 
was given by God to God's people as a ways or a way to get them to rest from their work, to devote one day to their God. God worked six, he rested one. It's different than today. Younger generations, we don't work one, rest six. We work six, rest one, right? That's the way God said that. So it's really a day where they are to enjoy spending time with God. Now, what's the challenge there? I mean, it's hard for us to get this because we don't live in an agrarian society. Maybe some of you are farmers that I don't think I know of any in here that that is your sole income is farming. But if farming was your sole income, resting one day is not a good idea. That means if you rest, you don't work, you don't eat, you don't get paid. And so what was God trying to teach them? He's trying to teach them, depend on me. Spending time with God is better than spending time with work. Who owns time? Who is outside of time? Who can manipulate that? God can. And so he would do that. The whole 40 days in the wilderness, you know, God said they're complaining about nothing to eat. He's going to send them manna. Hey, pick it up six days, but on the seventh, there's not going to be any. And then they didn't listen. And then it was full of, you know, they tried to save some. And it was full of maggots, right? They're only supposed to pick up one for the day and then pick up enough for two days on day six. And God miraculously provided. That's just an object lesson that God was giving them day in and day out that he can provide for everything they need. So what do we do when we get to the New Testament with the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath in the New Testament, Jesus fulfilled it. We know that. But the principle still remains. And so Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the Sabbath. The principle still remains the same. And when we get to the New Testament, after the resurrection, the early New Testament believers, they changed the Sabbath day of worship, which was rooted in their Jewish roots, and they put it on Sunday. Why? Well, because they could, because Jesus had already fulfilled it, but they knew that the day was important, and so they put it on the best day of the week, resurrection day. And so then they began to worship on that day. They began to give all their time to God and devote it and to enjoy him that day. And then in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews even says that Jesus himself is our Sabbath rest. That we don't need any more sacrifices. We don't need to work our way to God or anything like that. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. So how do we pull all this together? Well, we're not required to keep the Sabbath law But without it, without rest, without spending time with God, without intentionally being in His presence for a longer period of time than in here or in our daily quiet times, it is almost impossible for you and me to grow in Christ-likeness. And our culture works relentlessly to pursue what it finds most valuable, which is money. And yet this is countercultural of what Jesus is calling us to do. He's calling us to trust him with one day to not pursue financial gain, to not pursue that position, to not pursue that status, but to pursue him instead. I don't get that right very much. And if you're a type A also, it's hard to do that. You're thinking you're always got to be doing something. But God is saying, look, if you'll just spend time with me, you're the one that's going to be blessed. I'm the one that's going to be blessed. Do you have to do it? No, you don't have to do it. But it's going to be impossible to grow in Christ's likeness and to be a faithful servant without doing it. We want to stand before God as faithful and people that have been made into the image of his son. Part of that happens through resting in our personal life. The third one, family life. Look at verses 23 through 29 now. Family life. In those days I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them. Now he is laying hands on them. Again, descriptive. Um, And pulled out their hair. 
And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not King Solomon, or Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no, one, no king like him, and he was beloved by God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him the golden child, as it were, to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And here's a personal example again. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. You remember him, again, they're in cahoots together. Therefore, I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. The directive that we want to take from looking into our family life is this, and then I'll explain it. Upholding the sanctity of marriage is the best, as Christians, is the best way to disciple your children. Upholding the sanctity of marriage is the way God has given us in a primary way to disciple our kids. Christian families should grow in Christ together, not separately. Israel here, they broke God's command <clears throat> to not intermarry, Deuteronomy 7, 13. And then they also broke the promise that they made to God in Nehemiah 10, 30. So why would God command them not to marry people from other cultures. Many people will say, this is why we don't marry outside of a race. This has nothing to do with that at all. That's somebody that does not know the Bible, does not know how to interpret the Bible, if that's what you get from that. The whole point is that God's people were to be solely and purely His. Because other people could come into the Israelite communities if they came in the right way. So that's not the point. The point is God's people are God's people. They're not somebody else's people. They're God's people. They bear his name. They reflect his image. And he gives an example of Solomon. 1 Kings eleven four. 4, Solomon was good or fairly, you know, sane all the way until his life or most of his life. And then he marries foreign women that eventually lead to him bringing in idolatry in the kingdom. God knew that. God knew all about that. And so when we get to the New Testament, the New Testament does not forbid uh, pe marrying people from other cultures, but it does strongly caution a believer about marrying an unbeliever. This is not a very popular subject in our day, but it is the Word of God. It literally is, thus saith the Lord. 2 Corinthians six fourteen. do not become unequally yoked. That means if you are a follower of Jesus, do not marry an unbeliever, a non-follower of Jesus. But what should you do if you are? 1 Corinthians 7, 11, and 11 through 12 talks about that. If that is where you are, don't seek divorce though. Through your testimony, through your prayers, and the grace of God, your spouse may come to eventually know Christ. And so in this section, I want you to listen to verse 24, and then I'm going to illustrate why this is such an important issue for God. Verse 24, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. Now, I have another graph. I don't know why I have so many graphs this morning, but... Maybe I was feeling, you know, a little graphy this week or something. But I made this graph. This is original. It's not perfect. And I understand that these are some very complex issues. Please understand that. And I also understand that you may be thinking, that's not true of my family, so therefore it can't be true. No, it can still be true, but by the grace of God, it's not true of your family. But this is the reality or the, the danger that God is talking about when we marry unbelieving people. And if you're dating an unbeliever, 
please have in mind that you may marry this person. I hope you're not just missionary dating, right? Dating whoever for whatever reason, hoping to bring them to God. But this is what the graph shows. The B is for believer, NB is for non-believer. You have a blue and a pink, and blue and pink make what? Purple. <laughs> that's why all the kids are purple. So that's, my, that's the extent of my creativity right there. <laughs> um, but let's say the first generation, you have a non-believer and a believer. Statistics, as best we can say or show, is that out of that, the majority of them are going to be non-believers. Why? Because Jesus says that. It's not an, it's an, the broad way. It's easy to find that way. Only few find it. That is the narrow way. Coming to Christ is not the popular thing to do, right? Not everybody says yes to Jesus. So you have three kids. Let's say one of them becomes a believer, two becomes unbeliever. Now, most non-believers are not really looking for believers to marry. They're just not. Now, they may find a carnal Christian to marry, because it looks about the same thing. But even in that, let's say they have three kids each, and then now you have a believer, and then the rest are non-believers. And then the, the, the third generation of that, you have maybe a believer and the rest not. You can see how this trickles down. And I get, I, this is a complex issue. But please understand, God is concerned about the sanctity of what he instituted called marriage. And if you and I will uphold that sanctity and we will grow spiritually and we pray for the one another and we help one another and we uh, evangel or uh, we disciple one another, then your kids, your grandkids will actually benefit from it. And here's a great way to start. I love this. Our, our CEO, executive director, I'm not CEO, but executive director and treasurer of Mississippi Baptist Convention Board, Sean Parker, put this out. It's either today or last night. But this is a quote from him. We do not prioritize coming to church, or when we do not prioritize coming to church, we shoot ourselves in the foot, we shoot our kids in the leg, and, but we shoot our grandkids in the heart. Man, that's good. You upholding the sanctity of marriage, me upholding the sanctity of marriage is actually good for our kids. We wanna speak the language of God to our kids and over our kids. So are you speaking the language of God? Are you teaching your kids to speak with God and for God? Are they understanding the gospel? Or are you teaching them the language of sports? Are you teaching them the language of the culture? Are you teaching them the language of the political pundit? Are you teaching them the language of how to get a good job? The language of higher education? What language are you teaching your kids and your grandkids? Church life matters. Your personal life matters. And yes, family life matters. It's an ongoing restoration project every single day. And God has given us such a cool place to do that, a place that we can practice and work together at it. It's called the family. And we have that kind of responsibility, parents and grandparents, May God continue to restore what is broken in our families. Relentlessly pursue the sanctity of your marriage. Disciple your kids. Last one, real quick, prayer life. Prayer life. Let's finish Nehemiah with verse 30 and 31. Thus I cleanse them from everything foreign, and I establish the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times for the first fruits. Remember me, oh my God, for good. We're always in need of restoration in our prayer life. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Oswald Chambers said it uh, in spiritual leadership, his book speaking on, he said he was not a stranger to the throne of grace. I love that. I mean, Nehemiah's memoirs, they began with prayer, they're filled with prayer, and it ends with a prayer. Remember me, oh my God, for good. And we have to ask the question, did God answer Nehemiah's prayer? Did he answer Nehemiah's prayer? I would say he did. 
I mean, one reason is because we spent the last 10 weeks studying his memoirs that God preserved in his word. But more than what Nehemiah did, more than what Nehemiah accomplished, I hope you have been encouraged. I hope you've been motivated by who Nehemiah was. See, prayer does not always change our circumstances, but it always changes us. It always changes us. When you and I stand before God, it will not be about what we did and what we accomplished. It will always be about who you are. Are you in Christ or are you not in Christ? Did you allow the Holy Spirit to change you daily into the reflection of Jesus and how you love God and others? If you did, all that you did and accomplished out of this inner change, you're gonna be rewarded for it. I will be rewarded for it. But if you did not, every time I did not, everything that you or I may have worked for, did or accomplished, it will be burned up and we'll have nothing to show Christ for it. Please, please, please hear me. Don't waste your life pursuing the wrong things. Don't waste God's grace and sacrifice pursuing empty, vain, lifeless idols. Just like a farmer or a gardener who tends his field or the flowers, we must do the same thing in our prayer life. Cultivate your prayer life. It's one of the most important ways that God will renew you daily for his glory and the advancement of his kingdom. So in this, I want to draw two lines that Nehemiah points us to Jesus. Nehemiah came back after a time. He had to go back to the king, but he came back. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is doing the same thing. He may have ascended to the throne right now, but there's a time when he's going to come back. I don't know the day nor hour, neither do you. But what will he find in your life when he does? Will he be like Nehemiah and find a person that is so disarrayed that he can't tell the enemy from the person of God? Don't be the carnal Christian that reflects more of the world than of Jesus. So what will Jesus find when he comes back, when he returns in your life? And for some of you, it may be that you don't have Jesus in your life. And he's given you this moment right now to turn from your sin and to place your faith in him because he can wipe away your sins through his sacrifice on the cross and he will send the Holy Spirit into your life and give you new life, make you a new creation. You can do that today. That could be true of you today. So in just a few minutes, when we stand and sing, if that's you, you need forgiveness. You need this new life in Jesus. Then when we stand and sing, you don't sing, you just come forward. Let me know about that so that I can talk with you real quick about that. Or it may be that asking the question when Jesus returns, what will he find in your life? Have you taken your faith public through baptism? You may have been saved last week. You may have been saved 10 years ago, but have you put it on display through baptism? Jesus is calling you to do that. Are you passionately pursuing holiness in your church life, in your personal life, in your family life, in your prayer life? But also like Nehemiah, who came in to cleanse the temple, Jesus may need to cleanse you. There may be some things in your life that you need to let Jesus throw out. What has crowded his space in your heart? What are the things that you have given over instead of Christ? Jesus doesn't like to share space. He died for you. He is alive today for you. He wants to remake you. So what are those things that are crowding out the space of God? You need to get rid of those things. So you may not need to come tell me about them. If you want to come pray about them, I want to pray with you. But you may need to come and pray and kneel here and get that straight before you leave out of here because it will do no good taking those things out, the same ones that you brought in. Jesus wants to cleanse you of that. Jesus wants to take that priority and that space back. 
He wants to be Lord of your life. What will he find in your life? What will he find in our church? So however God is calling you to respond, I pray that we would be obedient and give him glory in how we do that. Let's pray. Father, we give you this time and this response time. Lord, I pray that you would minimize all distractions, that your spirit is moving, that our hearts would lean into what you want of us. Father, if you are calling us to make a decision this morning, Father, I pray for boldness for those individuals. I pray against the work of the enemy that is looking at clocks, that is thinking about what's next in the day, getting out of here. Lord, would you bind Satan from those thoughts in here? Lord, would you do the work for your people this morning, for your great glory in this space this morning? Lord, we need you. We need your glory to fill this place. We need you to change our lives. We need you to make more of us into Christ. Lord, would you do that for your great glory as we stand, as we sing, as we respond. May Jesus be exalted. May sinners be saved and may the faith of your church be strengthened. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So whatever decision that God is calling you to make, let's stand, you move, and let's respond.
have a seat for just a few moments. I want to let you know of a few decisions that's been made. And so uh, we have the Peebles coming and Tyler and Channing, and if you guys would come on up. And uh, you know that we had, uh, well, we got to meet with them. I got to meet with them. It was my privilege to be able to do that. And such a good meeting. Um, Hearing their story of how they came to faith in Christ, what God's doing in their life, how God brought them here, those are all important things for our our church story. Um, And I was so just thrilled to be able to meet them and what God's doing in them and how we as a church could be pouring into them and their family. And so uh, uh, they are coming by statement of letter. And so if you would rejoice in what God's doing, and by the way, before I say that, can I just say thank you for praying for them? Because they specifically told me they were stopped on the way out saying, hey, we're praying for you. That's family, right? And that's what God's doing in here. So thank you for doing that. So if you were rejoicing with me, what God's doing, bringing them here, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Can we have a seat? And then Kale, come on up, buddy. Kale is coming this morning, and he's wanting you to know that uh, he has prayed to receive Christ, and he is looking forward to being baptized. Um, and, and when Chad told me this, he texted me last night of how this happened, and then we were talking uh, a, f- a few minutes earlier before the service. I said, Chad, there, there's one uh, truth in this service that you're going to hear that this is the display of this um it is a family that is growing in christ together or is growing together they're growing in christ together but it's parents who upholding the sanctity of marriage is actually being able to shape their kids with the gospel um that's a beautiful thing because uh kale who who led you to the lord Tyler. tyler did that's, if you don't know who Tyler is, Tyler's his big brother. That's pretty awesome, dude. Good job. Uh, and so, but it's a team effort, right? Mom and dad keep talking, keep, re- keep shaping that. Uh, Tyler had a hand in that. Um, your, son, your Sunday school teachers had a hand in that. Um, just a blessed thing. And so we're going to be talking about uh, his baptism going forward. And so I, we wanted to just let you rejoice with us because every time a believer or a, a new person is born again, right, do you know what happens in heaven right now? God is throwing a party for you and for his glory that he saved somebody else. And so we get to rejoice with you. You hang out right there. Look, thank you for being here. In just a few moments, we're going to stand, and I want you to come love on these folks. Thank uh, the Lord for bringing them. Pray for them. Um, and Keep praying that God is going to move. I'm not going to give announcements, but I do want to give one reminder, okay? Next week, Brother Ray Spence is coming in. We planned him coming in because we're talking about reviving in Nehemiah. So this is, I'm hoping, a capstone, a one-day revival, but also the catalyst that is going to keep going, that God is going to keep saving, God is going to keep remaking, God is going to keep shaping, and God is going to keep sending us out of here. Amen? So when you come next week, make sure you come uh, to bring people that need to hear the gospel. You need to hear the gospel, and we're going to give a love offering to him because this is his ministry. This is how God provides for him, and so we want to bless him that way. Let's all stand. Thank you for being here this morning. Let me pray, and then uh, these folks are going to step up, and if you will come love on them. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for how you've moved in our midst this morning. Lord, we don't deserve how you meet with us and how you move, but God, you're so gracious, you're so good, and you're so merciful to us. And so thank you for being here with us, Father. Thank you for drawing new people to unite with this church. Thank you for salvation of Kale and for Tyler uh, uh, helping him understand the gospel and for his parents a witness and work in that as well. Thank you for a church that is on fire for the gospel and that is on your team to present and to share and to live the gospel outside of these doors. Lord, would you continue to use us? Um, and we thank you for what you're going to do next week through Brother Ray, Ray. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' powerful and precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.